Hi, my name is Bartek Dzienkowski and I am the CEO of RavingBots, a humble studio making vehicle simulators. I'm also the author of our new vehicle physics engine that is the topic of this presentation. It is my first presentation in which I discuss the technical aspects of our solution. However, instead of complicated formulas, I put a lot of pictures, so I hope you find this material easy to understand and interesting. The new vehicle physics engine is a part of Expansim project. Expansim is a universal vehicle simulator that we are developing. At the moment it offers all types of land vehicles, starting from an electric formula car to a diesel truck and ending on a tank with a gas turbine engine. Expansim is currently available on Steam in the Early Access section. I put a link in the description. In this material I'll focus on the technical side of our solution, so if you didn't have a chance to see it in action, then you should pause this video and check Expansim first before you proceed any further. Let's move to the presentation contents. You are probably wondering how we end up working on our own vehicle physics implementation instead of using an existing one. To answer that question, I will go back to the beginnings of my adventure with vehicle physics and move to the current requirements for vehicle simulators. After the short introduction, I will describe the general idea behind our vehicle simulation system. You will learn how the vehicle's powertrain is simulated and implemented. Probably the most challenging part of any vehicle physics engine is the simulation of wheels and tracks. In the next section of this material, I will review the differences between our original approach and other existing solutions. At the end of my presentation, I will summarize the current state of the project and indicate its future development directions. My journey with vehicle physics started a long time ago. In 2012, Someone gave me an idea to make an excavator simulator. I did a tech demo in which you could dig in the ground. The scoop physics was better than in most excavator simulators at that time. That was because during the interaction with the terrain, forces at the scoop were transferred to the arm to the vehicle. Thanks to that, the digging process looked much more realistic and less artificial. Unfortunately, the project was not commercialized, but I learned a few things about working with physics in Unity. The time spent on the excavator was not wasted though, because in 2017 my company was selected to make TS10, a new track simulator for a driving school. It was a large project that included a collection of modern Mercedes tracks, AI controlled traffic, a big world with 150 km of roads and lots of road events. Requirements for the realism of driving were put high. At that time there were no ready-to-use solutions that would work well with heavy tracks and trailers in all training scenarios. For that reason, I decided to come up with my own solution. Despite a very tight deadline, the project was a success and it is currently the most widely used professional training simulator in Poland. However, I had a feeling that the vehicle physics could be done better, so in 2018 I started working on it as a side project for fun. My goal was to learn the new entity component system in Unity and use it to write a new efficient vehicle physics engine from scratch. The project evolved into Expansim. When working with vehicle physics, I try to achieve three goals. First, my solution should be suitable for driver training, so it must handle light vehicles and heavy ones with trailers, which is not easy to achieve. The training process requires that the simulated vehicles realistically behave on the road and the terrain as well. Professional simulators are often equipped with motion platforms, so the engine API must provide smooth telemetry signals with minimum delay. In the case of training applications, you can get away with made up parameters and fake forces just to get the desired vehicle behavior. However, the second goal is the possibility to use the engine for scientific purposes, so I use real parameters which you can find in technical documents. Among many benefits, that also helps to verify the vehicle physics. Last but not least, the system must execute fast enough to avoid the aliasing problem when communicating with real vehicle electronics, which usually work at a frequency of 100 Hz. Realistic physics can be fun, so the third goal is to make it possible to use the engine in video games. I just need to make sure it doesn't eat all computer resources. The system must offer parameters that allow for balancing between precision and performance. For instance, AI traffic vehicles don't have to be simulated at the same level of detail as the player-controlled vehicle. 
To make it even more attractive, I assume the interaction with dynamic objects and terrain, which may not be necessary for the previous areas of application. Now let me talk about how it works. In my implementation, a vehicle powertrain comprises blocks that communicate with each other. For instance, an engine block generates torque, transmission block has a coupling mechanism and gears, and a differential block splits torque to wheel blocks. The simulation loop has three steps. First, torque and reflected inertia values are passed from the engine block to the wheel blocks. Next, forces acting on the wheels and the vehicle body are determined and new angular velocities of wheels are calculated. In the third step, angular velocity values are propagated back from the wheel blocks to the engine block. That's a pretty standard algorithm which is used in many real-time vehicle simulators. You are probably wondering why the torque signal is split into drive torque and brake torque. These two signals have the same physical unit but different effects in terms of simulation. The drive torque is a directional force and the brake torque is an absolute force that stops the motion. Such separation allows for preserving information about potential energy that holds a wheel in position. It also helps to prevent oscillations when a wheel is stopping. An important signal which is often ignored in other vehicle simulations is reflected inertia. Reflected inertia can be understood as the rotational mass of spinning elements at each simulation block. I use it to calculate realistic forces acting on the powertrain when the wheels are propelling the transmission and the engine. The powertrain model includes many blocks that serve different functions. Each block has a range of configuration parameters which define its behavior and a set of internal state variables which are updated in each simulation step. The blocks can be freely connected to match the powertrain of a real vehicle. At the moment they let you build a car, a truck or even a tank. Now that you understand the idea of the powertrain blocks, we can focus on their implementation. On the left diagram you can see a classic objective-oriented structure that has truck and trailer classes that derive from an abstract vehicle class. I use that pattern in TS10 and my older projects. However, in Expansim I switched to Entity Component System, which is visualized on the right diagram. In such a structure, a hierarchy of classes is replaced with layers of components. You are probably wondering, why would anyone trade a nice hierarchical structure for arrays of components? The answer is performance. In an objective approach, vehicles are object instances, which can be processed in parallel. In the component system, all components in the layer can be processed in parallel. That makes a huge difference, because when iterating through an array of components and executing similar operations, the processor cache is utilized efficiently and the calculations are faster. For instance, for a programmer it is easier to think about a wheel as a series of mathematical operations rather than an object. One of such operations is sending raycasts that have a form of commands for the physics engine. Everything works much faster if you batch a series of Raycast commands rather than send each command individually. In objective-oriented programming, you can achieve better performance by sacrificing code readability and making it difficult to manage. Entity Component System addresses the performance issues and the code is easy to manage by design. In the next part of the presentation, I will discuss the wheel model and my original approach to simulating it. Let's start from the basics. A wheel generates two contact force vectors, longitudinal and lateral. The magnitude of both forces is determined by friction between the tire and the surface. The longitudinal force depends on a slip ratio. The slip ratio is calculated as the difference between a free rolling speed and the actual rolling speed that is divided by the free rolling speed. The lateral force depends on a slip angle. The slip angle is the angle between the direction in which a wheel is pointing and the direction in which it is actually traveling. Some vehicle physics engines oversimplify the lateral force and focus on the longitudinal force curve. Sometimes complex curves are replaced by arbitrary parameters that have unclear physical justification and they make it difficult to calibrate the model using real-world data. In my wheel model, I try to simulate its complex behavior by relaying on real friction force curves that you can find in technical papers. 
I take into account that the shape of the longitudinal force curve also depends on the slip angle and the lateral force curve changes for different slip ratios. Of course there is much more to that because the wheel also generates self-aligning torque that is transferred to the steering wheel as force feedback. However, I promised no complicated formulas, so let's move to the next part. When we talk about different vehicle physics engines, we can divide them into three categories by a wheel representation, which is usually referred to as a wheel collider. The most straightforward and popular approach is representing the wheel as a raycast. Such a raycast is sent from a wheel anchor down to the ground to measure the distance. The distance is then used to calculate a vertical force that simulates the suspension and holds the vehicle above the surface. That technique is employed by, for instance, NVIDIA Physics. I had a chance to work with the system in Unity and Unreal Engine as well. A bit more complex approach is representing the wheel as a rigid body, which is connected to the vehicle body with joints. A rigid body comprises collider objects such as boxes, spheres and capsules. Usually, a wheel rigid body doesn't rotate per se, but generates equivalent contact forces. Joints simulate the suspension and they are handled by the physics engine internally. Currently you can find several implementations that use this concept, but I had a chance to develop my own version for TS10. During the development of ExpanSim, I experimented with a new original solution. I called it a hybrid wheel collider because it joins both previous approaches. A wheel is a rigid body connected to the vehicle body with joints, but the colliders are replaced with shapecasts. A shapecast is like a raycast, but instead of an infinitely thin line, a shape with volume is cast. It can be a box, sphere or capsule. Shapecasts exist only as mathematical operations, and they can be efficiently used for approximating the volume of dynamically deforming tire. In the next slides, I will review the behavior of those three types of wheel colliders in different situations. Let's start from the suspension. A Rayka suspension uses information about a vehicle body to calculate sprung masses and exact forces holding the vehicle at a certain position. External forces acting on the vehicle body are not taken into account. If you reduce the suspension stiffness enough, then the vehicle chassis will touch the ground. It doesn't look nice and to prevent that, additional support colliders are added to the vehicle body so that it looks like the vehicle is resting on its wheels. If you make the suspension very hard, then the vehicle will start jumping. When the ground is in the range of a raycast, the system generates a vertical force strong enough to move the vehicle body above the range of the raycast. This causes micro-oscillations. Both the rigid body and the hybrid approaches use joints that are stabilized by iterative solver in the physics engine. In this way, you can achieve a realistic suspension that works well in different situations, including when external forces act on the vehicle body. Of course, this solution is more computationally demanding, but it allows you to realistically simulate a vehicle with a semi-trailer, which generates external forces acting on the vehicle. It also opens new possibilities, such as modeling the semi-active suspension present in modern vehicles. Let's now consider the front collision case. In a basic raycast approach, there is only one vertical raycast sent from a wheel anchor, so there is no information about obstacles in the front of the wheel. For this reason, the wheel will pass a curb without slowing down. A rigid body wheel will detect a curb and handle the collision, However, the wheel will be significantly slowed down by the collision because of the lack of elasticity. In my hybrid approach, a wheel has a tire that will deflect during the collision with a curb, so the wheel will not lose as much velocity as in the previous case. The velocity change can be better observed in the case of a side collision. Again, a simple raycast will slide on a curb like it was nothing. However, this effect causes another problem. Imagine a track that tilts when entering a corner. The side collision force is not present and the sides of the wheels cannot support the vehicle body, so as a result it rolls over. One of the workarounds dealing with this problem is moving the center of mass of the vehicle body to an unrealistically low position. For the same case, a rigid body wheel works much better. However, sometimes the wheel may bounce back from a curb like a block of solid material. 
This effect can be minimized by assembling the wheel rigid body from rounded colliders. The deflection of a hybrid wheel helps to slip onto a curb, but with a lot of resistance. The last case is a bottom collision. You probably guessed that raycasts do not work well with narrow crevices. However, here I want to talk about the case when two colliders forming the ground are placed adjacently. Both the raycast and the hybrid solutions work well. However, there is a problem with the rigid body approach. The wheel collider can be bumped up at the point of contact of two ground colliders even if they are perfectly aligned to each other. That is because a rigid body slightly overlaps with objects that is touching. As a result, it can hit a corner while sliding on the surface. Unfortunately, you can't build a world from one big collider for many reasons. One of the dirty workarounds is detecting such collision cases and applying a force impulse that fixes the vertical velocity. Another challenge is the stabilization of a vehicle when it stops on a slope. Physics engines that execute in real time do not store the record of all forces acting on an object, so you cannot easily calculate what amount of counterforce you need to apply to stop that object in place. On the one hand, if you put too little force, the object will drift. On the other hand, if you put too much force, the object will move in the opposite direction. That is how you get oscillations. The standard vehicle support in physics uses sticky behavior. It works as follows. If brake torque is applied and it causes the wheel to rotate in the opposite direction, then the vehicle should be locked in place. The velocities are zeroed and this locking method does not reflect the tire friction forces. The vehicle may be unlocked if the wheel receives input drive torque or the vehicle body collides with another object. For my vehicle physics implementations, I have developed a limited force effector that is activated when a vehicle stops. The effector stabilizes the wheel in place and the strength of the effector is limited by the tire friction force. This mechanism also handles external forces acting on the vehicle body. As a side note, the sticky behavior mechanism effectively prevented me from implementing a simple training case in which a semi-truck with a semi-trailer must smoothly take off on a slope by operating the clutch. I found it easier to invent my force effector than continue fighting with this sticky idea. A separate stabilization problem can be identified for lateral forces, especially in the case of tires with a high friction coefficient that is greater than 1.0. Such tires are used in racing cars. Drive and brake forces affect only the longitudinal motion, so for the lateral motion we do not have a special event in which we can apply a sticky behavior mechanism to prevent lateral oscillations. In the raycast approach, the lateral force is determined by a lateral slip velocity. It may happen that the force calculated in this way doesn't slow down the wheel but causes its movement in the opposite direction. To make matters worse, the wheels on the opposite sides may fight with each other. That is the source of unpleasant vibrations. A common workaround is limiting the lateral forces, which causes a vehicle to understeer. In my solutions, I consistently use the limited force effectors as they can be configured to work in a specified direction. They can handle high lateral forces without malfunctioning. The last part of this series is dedicated to the continuous track collider. In the old excavator simulator, I implemented tracks using a sequence of raycast wheels. However, this solution, among many other flaws, is very limited when it comes to realistically deforming the terrain, due to inaccurate contact positions and pressure forces. In Expansive, I designed a new dedicated track collider that shares the same idea and principles as the hybrid wheel collider. However, there are two differences. First, the shape cast operations form the shape of a continuous track. Second, each track collider comprises a sequence of connected rigid body segments. The segments correspond to stations in a real caterpillar suspension. The number of segments can be freely adjusted. I usually try to achieve the best effect with a minimum number of segments to save performance. Let me now summarize the comparison of these three approaches. The Raycast method is limited by design. 
It doesn't work well with collisions and the contact forces are unrealistic. There is also not much room for improvement in the case of the standard vehicle physics offered by Physex. In Unity, there is no access to the internal implementation of the wheel collider. In Unreal Engine, you have access to the source code of Physex and you can modify the vehicle physics, but it is not a pleasant experience either. Please don't get me wrong, the offers of the standard vehicle support did a great job when it comes to simplicity and performance for most video games. The rigid body solution consumes much more computational resources, but it also gives much better results. Unfortunately, there are still some collision problems that could be effectively fixed by making changes in the collision handling system deep inside the physics engine library. Nevertheless, the rigid body approach still has some room for improvement. Theoretically, it would be possible to simulate tire softness by adapting the wheel colliders. However, unlike shape casts, Colliders do not have an origin and direction that can be used to determine the direction of deflection in some complex collision situations. The hybrid solution has a similar resource consumption as the previously discussed one. However, it's easier to control the level of detail of shape cuts on the fly since they are just mathematical operations and not objects like colliders that need to be activated, deactivated and linked, unlinked from a rigid body. For AI-controlled vehicles, shape casts can be even replaced by faster ray casts. Perhaps a hybrid wheel is not the easiest one to play with because it has much more parameters that determine the wheel dynamics. On the other hand, you can achieve high fidelity when simulating a real vehicle. To conclude, I see the hybrid approach as the next evolution step. In my opinion, it is the most promising direction for further development. At the current stage of development, my new vehicle physics engine can be considered as production ready. Of course, there are still some parts of it that could be done better and they will be done better because such project is a never ending story. I still plan to add the terrain modification physics that I developed for the excavator project. However, I also need to consider the voice of expansive community and the current priority is adding AI vehicles. A promising idea would be integrating my vehicle physics with Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine has better graphics and performance than Unity. It also gives free access to the source code and there are no constraints when it comes to asynchronous code execution. That would allow me to make my system work even faster. However, regardless of all the advantages, as a studio we are limited financially. I am optimistic about obtaining funds for this purpose, but I cannot promise anything due to unpredictable nature of the universe. Thank you for staying with me until the end of my presentation. If you are interested in the subject of vehicle physics and want to learn more, please feel free to drop me an email. See you next time!